All right. We should all be uh, started now. The recording has started. So thanks again, everyone, for taking your time out of our busy schedules, as I know we all have, and joining me for our next session. Today we're going to be talking specifically about the 808D control and how it works in the turning environment. So this is going to be, this is intended to be a, um, a basic seminar, stepping you, a user, through how to set up a system as well as uh, do some basic programming on the 808D for turning. I am your instructor, Chris Pollack. I'm a de dealer support specialist for Siemens based out of New York. I cover the East Coast for Siemens, and my contact information is here provided for you. So if you guys ever need a hand, by all means, feel free to reach out to me, uh, either at my phone or certainly my email, which is probably the best scenario if you need anything in the future. As a uh, up and coming, just to give you guys an idea of some of the things that uh, you have to look forward to here in the future, we try to do these sessions about one every six weeks if we can, um, barring you know scheduling conflicts and whatnot. So here we have a couple events coming up. Uh, our next one of September is going to be our first maintenance-based webinar, so it'll be interesting to see how well uh, that goes. We'll actually have to link into a control and do things a little differently than we've currently been doing them. Um, but that will be what we call preventative maintenance on an 840-828. Uh, so we're going to talk about um, steps you can take as a user or as a service technician um, or as a dealer or importer to help um, gather information from the control just, get, just in case something ever happens, so more of a preventative maintenance side. Um, after that, we are going to be doing one in October, the end of October, uh, working with CAD CAM and High Speed Cycle 832. So this will be a more of an advanced workshop, and here we're going to specifically be looking at the 840 and the 828 controls as well. And then in December, we're going to start to look at advanced turning cycles in Shop Turn and Program Guide. So we're going to start to show you some of the, uh, the more higher-end features that can be found in the 828 and certainly the 840 when you get to shop turn and program guide programming. So let's talk about the 828 for a second. There are two main controls within its portfolio, and this kind of just shows you guys how it fits within the layout of Siemens and the hierarchy of our control protocols. So we certainly have the standard 808D, which is the control platform you see on the far left. And then we have a next step up, which is the 808D Advanced. So everything we see today would apply to both the standard or the advanced system. From an operation and programming, aside from some added features, um, they're pretty much going to be identical, so you could transition between the two. Um, well, what's really the difference, a couple add-on features, which you'll see here in a second, uh, separate the advanced to the basic. Um, and that's pretty much about it, a couple hardware different differences in configuration. Um, then from there, in the product portfolio, you do step into the 828 basic. That's our, our next series up. And then we have the standard 828D control. And then for our very high-end systems, we have our Siemens Cinemaric 840D. So that would be the total product offering within the Siemens portfolio. So to just give you guys an overview of, of some of the base differences between the 808D and the 808D Advanced, um, the 808D can control up to four axes, but up to four axes specifically viewing the spindle. So you're not going to run any more than, than three linears or linear rotary combinations. Um, so it's really designed for a three-axis mill, per se. Um, but when you get to the advanced, we can handle up to five axes, including the spindle. So here we could do you know, a three-axis mill with a fourth-axis rotary table on the advanced system. So that would be a key difference. Um, certainly, the interface as to how we communicate with the drive is differently. Um, there's a, what they call a pulse interface communicating to the drive module, which on the, the 808 basic is that V60 you see on the screen. When you get to the advanced, it's a full digital servo system. 
Uh, and with digital, you get all of the features and benefits with that, advanced servo tuning, um, advanced features for surfaces and look-aheads, um, and there's certainly more software options. As far as the voltage side, um, the basic can run on standard 220 line voltage, while when you get to the advanced, since it is a digital platform, it does need to run on 400 volts. Um, you'll also see in the motor sizes, um, we have a much larger range of motors when you get to the, the advanced. So the basic will run from anywhere from a 4 newton meter up to a 10 newton meter motor. But when you get to the advanced, then you can run as low as a 1.9 newton meter, but go as high as a 40 newton meter motor. So it just gives you a little bit more flexibility in the range of the product offering. So, as I said earlier, this is a, uh, a basic setup and programming seminar, specifically for the 808D, looking at it from the turning side. We have in previous sessions looked at the milling. I wanted to take a chance to look at the turning side of the control. So we're going to get in, we're going to create some tools, we're going to create a part program, we're going to go in and edit it, simulate it, and even go through the running of a program. So from here, you should have a pretty good understanding of, you know, the full process from you're powering up the machine, starting it up, right through to running a program in the system. This would be the program example that we're going to take a look at today. So it's going to give us a chance to do a bunch of different operations. I uh, was just giving a quick chat to one of our colleagues that was having some trouble with the audio, sorry. Um, so this will be the example we're going to do today. Uh, here we're going to get an opportunity to um, do a few different operations. I'm going to come in with the turning tool, we're going to face off the part, and we're going to turn this irregular shape, this OD shape. We're then going to select a grooving tool and put in a thread relief groove and then put a back groove. We'll actually put the 2 inch 12 threads per inch thread on the part. And then we're going to take a drill and uh, physically drill a one inch hole through the part. So from there, it should be a good overview sampling of what you would what a user would typically do um, when they're going to leverage a control like this in the field. So our first area that we want to start with is what we consider offsets and setup mode. So here we're going to start to talk about what you're going to see, and we're going to go through it um, in 808 on PC, and what you're going to see when you first come into the machine, power it up. So the first thing you're going to notice, um, specifically on the basic systems or on the advanced systems that have incremental encoders, is you will be required to reference the machine. So referencing is really just a way of dataming the system so it knows where all of its offsets come from. Uh, there's typically some switches involved. The machine will move back, trigger a switch, and then find a pulse on its encoder. So specifically what you want to take a note to is on the jock pad, there's these two little circular bullseyes. That is signifying the home location. So on my machine, I can simply turn the drives on by popping out the e-stop and hitting reset, and then I physically jog each axis, and I'm using the button that has that little symbol on it, jogging it to towards home reference time, reference position. Um, the other thing these symbols can also kind of represent is for hand wheel functionality, if we want to select between the different hand wheels that also is showing there. So here I would jog in these two directions to reference the machine. And what you're going to see here is when it first comes up, if it requires referencing, you're going to see that the little bullseye is going to be blank. There's not going to be any bullseye. And then as I start to jog the machine towards reference position, it, once it makes it, I'm going to get this little bullseye to come up. And at the end of the day, I should see two bullseyes once the system is referenced. From there, once we have it referenced, we can progress over to or move over to our jog system. The, the jog area will allow me to change tools, set some offsets, um, physically move the machine around. 
Um, certainly I could use a hand wheel or a jog pad. Since we're just on a simulator here, I'm only going to have the jog pad available to me. So I'll show you how to do everything using that jog pad that you see on the right side of your screen. Once we've gone through JOG, we're then going to progress over to our offset table and talk about how do I create some tools. And I do have a few tools already created for our job, but we can build a couple new ones and just talk about tool definition in general when it, when it applies to the 808 control. We can also talk about the work coordinate system and what work coordinates are available if you want to move all of your tools. Um, historically in a lathe, most people don't leverage work coordinates very much, especially in you know what we consider like a teach lathe product, which is, you probably see this control on. So normally what you'll do is you're, you'll establish all of your tool offsets from your machine zero position. Uh, but it is nice having the work coordinates available to you, so if you need to move all the tools the same amount, you can do that through a work coordinate. So it's something we're going to take a look at here. And then the next step would be to show you a little bit about MDI and how MDI works. Um, you'll use a combination of MDI and the jog screen to perform a lot of typical operations that you would do maybe in a setup or you know, proving something out briefly. Within MDI, um, we have functionality like the load file or save file commands that certainly let me create libraries of little MDI programs, so I can do that. Um, I can just load any file into MDI I want, or vice versa, if I wrote it here, I can save it and make a little library of different um, MDI functions. From there, the next logical step, once we've created some tools, will be to set those tools up. And we are going to use the measure X and the measure Z functions for establishing the tools. So here we'll come in, we'll define some simple diameters, jog it around, or just find a linear position, and you'll see how it starts to write to the offset table. So we're now going to transition over to the live portion of our webinar. So let me just uh, sh switch over to that application. So what I'm bringing up here right now which we should all see on the screen, is what we call 808 on PC. And 808 on PC is a free offline machine emulator or control emulator. A um, little more than just offline programming because it allows us to do everything we could do on the machine tool on the PC. Um, so if you simply go to our website, you can actually download the 808D uh, on PC simulator and you have it available just like I do, it's free of charge. So when we first come in, I'm generally going to see the reference point screen first. Now, I know I'm at reference point first because in my upper left-hand corner of my navigation window, it tells me I'm at reference point. I see that right up here. But more importantly, if I look at the reference point button, there's a big orange light on top of it. So this is giving me an indication that I'm currently sitting in my reference screen. So when I come into the system, you see that my bullseyes aren't checked. I do need to make sure I have some form of a feed rate, so I'm going to crank up my override. Generally, if I first power up, I want to just bring my spindle override to some valid position. And now I'm going to jog, and I'm going to jog in the direction of my micro switches. And certainly that could change based on the builder. In this case, I want to move my X in a plus direction, my Z in a plus direction, and I would just initiate this until the system comes back. So you're to single axis at a time. I could do either order. Um, generally, you want to be conscious of potentially a collision point, especially on lays with tail stocks. So I would normally jog the X all the way out to its reference position first and then jog my Z back. This way, hopefully, not running into an issue with my tail stock if I have one. So once the machine has been referenced, I now can go over to the jog screen by selecting the jog button. The jog button is just to the left of reference point, and you'll notice as I hit the jog button, the indicator now becomes orange, and then the top navigation portion of our screen, I still have the M. The M signifies machine mode, but I'm now in jog. So if I wanted to get back to reference, I could hit reference, I'd be back there, it would maintain its bullseyes. If I want to go to jog, I select the jog. Now, one thing to note with the reference point, if you have an 808 basic system or the standard 808, whenever you e-stop the machine, you will be required to re-reference it. If you have an advanced, then the system will 
maintain reference until you physically shut off power. Or in the advance, you also can have absolute encoders. If you have absolute encoders, you would never need to reference the machine. So those are slight differences between the two, two control portfolios. So when I first power up, I do want to be conscious of the axis display that I'm looking at and what these values mean. So if I look at the, just above the X field, I have a, a little indicator that says MCS, Machine Coordinate System. So these values right now, as I move the machine around, so if I pick my jog, I'll slow my over right now, and I start jogging my Z or jogging my X in some direction, right, either way or wherever I'm going, those values here currently are relative to that zero that I referenced to that machine coordinate system. So if I want to view these numbers based on maybe some of the offsets that are active, in this case my tool four is loaded, I do have to select the WCS button. And you'll see as I toggle between the two, in this case my X value changes. So it all depends on the offsets that I have active for myself. But WCS, and generally that's what I'm going to select right when I first power up the system, stands for work coordinate system. So this is now taking into account all the offsets that potentially could be set for a given tool. Okay, so we come in, we start moving the machine around with our jog pad or our hand wheel, depending on what we have available to us, and we'll start to see our display change, our, our numbers change. Now, all these little indicators are different indicators to you of currently what's set up on the system. Um, probably an important one is the fact that G500, or our base zero, is enabled. So I'm not currently calling up any of my work coordinates. I am in an exact stop mode. That's my G60 right here on the screen display. Uh, my TFS window, this is a very important window. This stands for tool, feed, or speed. And this is telling me what is currently loaded on the system. So the machine thinks it has tool four, either in its tool post or the turret index position would be around to tool four. It has currently no feed, but it's showing me relative to my override. So as I move my override up or down, I can get an acknowledgement here of where my override sits. Um, currently, if I tell the machine to move, I would be in an inch per minute mode. So I'm not a slave to the spindle having to be running for me to move the machine. And then I have my spindle commands and a little load meter here. So when I come into the system, probably one of the first screens that I'm going to want to get really familiar with or functions is the TSM mode. And TSM stands for tool or tool change, spindle, or spindle commands, or M for M code functions. So right now, I could start tool changing the machine. So if I knew that I wanted tool one to be called up for argument's sake, I can Type in a value of one, hit my input key, that would be my yellow button right here, and then initiate a cycle start. Once I've initiated the move, you will see in the TFS screen, tool one is now selected, and then I can change from there. And you can move the machine out onto a new location, and put the next one, Acknowledge it. This is just telling me I'm not in a safe state because I haven't put the machine in a current location where it would be possibly safe to, to tool change. Um, certainly in simulation there. It's a little hard, you don't have a visual here as where you are in space. So you can start using the tool change function to start to select different tools. And this is important once we go to start setting the tool offsets. Next I have is my spindle commands, or spindle state. So if I wanted my spindle to be running right now, I could give the machine some RPM. Now when I come down to a field and I see this little horseshoe, that means that I use the select key right here between my arrows to change the function state. So do I want to run the spindle clockwise? Do I want to run it counterclockwise? What am I doing with the spindle? So I'm going to run it clockwise, cycle start. Now my spindle is turning in a clockwise direction. System is currently running. We can use our spindle commands across the bottom of the screen as well to now stop and start my spindle. 
So we can start to control the state of the spindle right here. You can activate work coordinates within the screen. So I can load my different work coordinates. The system supports 54 through 59. Or I can issue alternate M codes. And in this case, I would just type the number of the M code. So if I wanted to run flood coolant running for argument's sake, I just type in the number 8 for my M8. Cycle start, it will initiate that command. So a lot of the stuff I would normally do inside of a MDI type of arena, I would use the TSM for. So I can quickly spin the turret, fire up my spindle, and go try to, say, set up a tool. Now, as I start to use this stuff, it's going to be referring to a, a tool library, right? A, a list of tools that I, I have. I either haven't created yet or I'll have previously created. So in this case, if I go to the offset screen by hitting my offset button, offset will put me to the offset tables. And we call it offset because it's not just tools, but it's all offsets. So it's tools, toolware, work offsets, user variables, a whole bunch of stuff in here that I can see. But the first thing I'm going to see when I come in, in this case, is my tool list. And I, and I know I'm on my tool list because the button itself is blue. As I toggle between my different pages, you'll notice the button stays blue on the, the page I'm currently looking at. So I select tool list, and this would be where my tools start to come into play. So if I have offsets here, these offsets will be shown. Now these offsets are going to be automatically written, so as we start to set some tools, you're going to see how we write to these offsets. But if I was going to create a tool, just to go through the mechanism, let's say I'm going to create a simple turning tool. What you want to do is you want to hit the new tool button. It doesn't matter where your cursor is. I select what type of tool I'm creating now. Is it turning tool, grooving tool, drilling, or tapping? So these are the four primary tools we support in the 808. Now, let's say you say, well, Chris, I'm, I'm threading. What do I do? In a scenario with the thread, it's really no different as a turning tool, so I would just create it as a basic turning tool. And in fact, my tool three is my threading tool. So that's the one I'm currently using for a threading tool. So if I was going to create a basic finish tool, let's say I don't have one, select turning tool, give it a tool number that hasn't been used. If you have a turret, you'd want it to correlate to the turret position that's going to be in. If you don't, you just use any arbitrary number. You don't have to go in consecutive order. So I could jump to, you know, tool eight right now. Pick your orientation or edge position. So this is important. Is it an OD tool? Is it an ID tool? So this, this is going to look like I would orient it on the machine. So number one is an ID back tool. Number two is an ID standard turning tool. Number three would be an OD turning or facing, right? You can do the same thing, but it's an OD tool. And four would be an OD tool, but I'm working on the back side of the insert or the back of the, the direction, so I'm moving, working towards my tail stock. So here we would want to pick an orientation position three to denote an OD tool. Select OK. It builds the tool with the image, shows me my tool number. I get a D, which is multiple cutting edges of one. I haven't set anything else up. My offsets will get set when I touch the tool off. The radius, let's say I knew it was a 15 thou nose radius. I type it in. Now, if I mistakenly pick the wrong orientation, I can come back and change it here if I wanted to. Now, the, certainly the picture correlates with this. So if I do an ID tool, you see how the insert's now facing up. So whether I get the grooving, whether I get a drill, and the position it's in. So you, can, you don't have to remember what these little orientation numbers were or for. You can simply just look at the icon that's right here to the left under the type, and at least denote whether it's an OD, an ID, a back turn, you know, what did I physically create. And then you continue from there. Now, within the offset table, I do certainly have where. Where can be used to compensate for maybe any inaccuracy in my setup. And this would be a small incremental value adjusting the you know, diameter or linear position that the tool is going to work to. I have my work offset screen, and this is where all my work coordinates are set up. So remember, originally I said there was a G500 loaded. Well, that's this first one right up here. So 
that's my base reference. When I say base, that will include any values in the work coordinates. So once there's a value in here, even if I select a work coordinate, this is going to get summed together. It's your first zero shift, so be careful when you're using the base offset. Normally, I like to leave my base always at zero, and then just use one of my six work coordinates here, 54 through 59. Okay. Now, once I've created some simple tools, I'm probably going to want to set those tools or touch those tools off. So certainly I could come back to my jog screen and start to use my measure tool, but maybe I want to start my spindle and I don't want to use the TSM window. I want to use MDI, let's say. So MDI, the button is actually labeled MDA. MDA stands for Machine Data Automatic, but MDA brings you into what the industry knows to be MDI, Machine Data Input. So in this case, I can start typing a simple instruction. So what I had had up there on the screen, and I'm going to put it back in, is I was telling the system I want to make sure I'm in straight RPM, G97. I want to run the spindle at some given RPM, let's say 500. I want to turn the spindle on clockwise with an M3. Now, I don't want to leave the machine in a um, in, in intermittent state. I want to let it reset when it's done, so I want to end this little program. But I want the machine to continue keeping the spindle running. So if I was to give it an M2 or an M30 right now, it would shut the spindle off when I was done. If you give it an M32, however, that will leave the spindle in whatever modal state it was currently in, but still reset the program. So I simply give it this instruction, cycle start. My spindle turns on. She's now running at 500 RPM. We could do tool changes here. So if I knew that I wanted to tool change to tool 8, now you'll notice if I give it the M30, it shut my spindle off. So that was kind of before. But here you can see I can do a quick tool change here. Just call up my T code. I don't need to give any other additional. I can give it the cutting edge if I wanted to. That's the D number. But they always default to D1 the number from D1 to D9. So here, if I'm just using my, my basic offsets, right, so I have just everything at a D1, I don't even have to type it. I can just type in T8, and it will index to tool 8. So you can start to use MDI for those quick little functions. Um, what's nice with this is I can create a library. So like if I wanted to save this as my simple tool change one, I can hit Save File. I can tell it where I want to save it to. I could create a folder if I wanted to. I could have a folder pre-created with all my MDI programs, and I could start to save all of these into that library. And then when it's time to use them, just go to Load File and drill into the one you want. So like here, I created a quick little home routine. Tell the machine to go to home. This is something we'll be using in the program a little later. Um, but I could use it in MDI. So I could have common functions that I use in part programs as well as MDI, and I can just grab them. So it really makes MDI pretty, pretty powerful, pretty flexible to be able to really treat it as if it was just a full-blown auto screen. So really all we did was, and it's why we call it machine data automatic, we've created an auto function that also has an editor built into it is really what you get with our MDI function. So the next step, once I've started to use the machine or select some tools, is probably set the tool offsets. So you are going to use the measure tool functions for that. So when I go back to jog, I select measure tool, and now I have two options. Am I setting the system up in the X, or am I setting it up in my Z? So from here, I would jog the machine, you know, bring it to some location, maybe take a light cut, measure it up. See, the system is asking for the diameter. That's why I have a little diameter symbol. So let's say, for argument's sake, upon this measurement, I find that I have a two-inch diameter. I'm physically touching or physically machined. Simply type in the diameter and then hit set length X. Now I will immediately see my display updates to that value. If I don't, I did something wrong, so you need to stop and go back and figure out why that didn't happen. And then I can go in and I can set my Z. So maybe I came forward, touched the front of my part, moved my X in or out, whatever I want to do, cleaned it up, 
do I want to leave a little material? Certainly I could, or I could just say, nope, set it to zero, and now it's set to zero. Now what is it doing in the back end? Well, it's just writing these two offsets that I was talking about earlier. Right? When I created eight right here, let's go back up to it, these were zero. There was nothing in there. So the system is just calculating, in this case, since I have no work coordinates so and no other offset set, the distance from wherever machine zero or my reference point was to where it's establishing this zero. And it's just doing the math all for you. So since you told it you were at a diameter two, it knows that that's radially only one inch away. So it's saying, okay, wherever I'm at, I'm adding an additional inch to figure out where that zero point would be. The system at the end of the day needs to know where the machine zero or the part zero is. Um, the typical lathe, dead center of the part, usually at the face. Okay. And then you just kind of repeat the process from there. So, you know, if I was to uh, come back, maybe go to TSM, load up tool nine. Tool nine is now in my spindle. Once tool nine is in there, you'll see it will update the graphic a little bit to show you that you're pointed in any other direction. So here I would probably have to have some hole already in my part and then I'm just bringing the tool into the ID of the part, come back, measure the ID, type in whatever that value was, set length, again, it's the same process. Z, you know, maybe I'm touching the front, a little gauge block, a little shim block, and you just repeat the process. For drills, threading tools, it's all gonna be the same basic process. And again, it continues to just write the appropriate offset to whatever the given position is. So here, there's a 10 thou difference, because I hadn't moved Z, but I did tell it there was plus 10 thou when I said it the last time. Okay. So we're gonna go and we're going to segue back to our slideshow. And we're gonna start to look at the next area that we wanted to talk about today. And that's really creating programs. You know, certainly I can start to see how I can move the machine around a little bit, maybe change some tools. Uh, create some simple offsets. The next step, however, is, boy, I, I gotta create a part program, right? I gotta write a program. So in the 808 control, so this is gonna be, uh, if you're familiar with other versions of our control, you're gonna find this is, this is very, very similar. We try to keep all the controls as close as we can, um, so you're not completely learning totally new functions. So in this case, I am going to select the program manager button right off of my physical keyboard, wherever it is, and that's gonna bring me over to the program manager screen. And that's the screen I now currently see on the right side of the display. And that's really kind of like Windows Explorer. You know, that's where all my part programs will exist. You know, all the files I can navigate up and down through. I can access my USB. All these systems can standard with the USB port uh, or maybe RS-232. On the advanced system, I can support networking. But I'm gonna use all this I'm gonna manage the files all from my program manager, hence why it's called manager. Once I've come in, the next logical step is I'm going to use the vertical soft keys, like I see here on the left side of the display, to tell it what I wanna do. So I could click copy paste, I can move programs around, or I can select new, and new allows me to create a G-code program. Now, in the 808, we don't support any full-blown conversational. There is no shop turn in the 808 control. Uh, it's just um, really what we call program guide, and that is G-code with conversational assist or cycle support like we also like to call it. So that's why there's no other option here. I select new, just give it a program name, and select okay. Once I've done that, then we can start writing a program. Now, what I'm gonna do for you guys is we're gonna initiate a handout right now. So I have a, a little handout, and let me see if I can set it up here. Uh, boy, I don't know if I can do it while I am sharing. Let me... Uh, let me see if I can just pause the sharing for a second. You know, it doesn't give me the tool. I may have to do this towards the end. Um, but I do want to give you the, uh, I will give you this handout towards the end. Um, there's a way I can, I can pass you the handout. So once we get done with the recording towards the end of today, um, we will set up a, um, 
I will I'll transfer this handout to you. But what this is is just a quick little reference guide or chart. When you're first learning to do GNM code, specifically in the 808 control, gives you some of the key functions as well as some just some typical examples of how to start a program, kind of what the syntax would look like, how would I handle tool changes, and whatnot. So we will we will send that over to you guys um, before we end this session. Okay, so once we've created it, look at our little handout, we start to come up with some structure. You're going to use the program editor interface screen to start writing your program. And it's going to look like you see it on the screen. So you're going to have a bunch of G code functions. I can put in notes or comments, do all kinds of stuff. Uh, but I'm going to just start typing out that program. So you're going to see that here in a second. We will start to use the different functions, horizontal soft key brings up. So the edit screen will be used to certainly manage the, the editor. I can renumber functions, I can search, I can do marks, copying and pasting all from the edit. Um, the contra term we'll see here in a sec. The other popular ones are like drilling or turning. I can support a bunch of different drilling cycles, threading cycles, or that would be tapping. Turning handles my stock removal, uh, my groove, my contour. So the stock removal is going to be my irregular contour shape. So you're going to get to see that. There is an active function, this G, G active, that allows me to insert those types of instructions. So any of those instructions you see on the display, like uh, absolute or cosine or incremental positions, chamfer, radius, the CRF, CHF, CHR, all that stuff can be inserted with this little screen here. And the contour, well, that's where I get to describing the shape of the contour. And this is for OD or ID. They can be irregular shaped contours with pockets or just standard turning. Um, so you're going to see me go in and actually draw a shape in this mode, and you're going to see how the resulting code is going to look like in the part program. Once we've gone in and we've created it, then we are going to simulate it. Now, the one thing that's a little different in the 808 control is you do need to be in an auto mode while you're in simulation to actually see it. So the system will even prompt me, and I'll leave it so it forces me to prompt, telling me to be in auto. Um, but once I'm in auto, I'm using the machine's panel to cycle start. So you won't be doing concurrent simulation on this system. Um, like you probably are, are normally used to, maybe on some of the more advanced controls. Um, so you know you'll you'll pretty much be you know doing your prove out while the system isn't currently running anything else. But this is kind of how it's going to look. Uh, you're going to see it's a wireframe base. So red represents rapid, and then the, the blue here is the center line of the cutter. So the center of the, the physical cutter path. We do have a little material removal mode that gives you um, a little bit more like a solid graphic. So if you want to, you can play with that or turn that on. I usually don't find it's all that necessary, but it's a function certainly within the control. So what we want to do is we want to transition back over to our simulator, and we want to start writing some programs. So we are going to, I want to bring up the print. So what I have here is I have the part print for us. So just so you guys can kind of keep it kind of fresh in your mind on the shape that we're going to start to create. So like I said earlier, I'm going to select my program manager function, and that's going to bring me over to the program manager area. So in here, I'm currently in the NC. So NC is anything that resides physically in the machine control. So anything that I want sitting on the machine in its memory is going to be under NC. There can be folders, so I can create folders and subfolders and do all that kind of stuff, or I can just have files right here in the root of NC. But I can also manage USB sticks, so I can jump to the USB and I can copy things in from the USB, bring things back over. Uh, if I needed to, I could execute from the USB. Um, I have RS-232 capabilities. Um, user files, that allows me in this case to get out, is really handy on 808 and PC, to get out to my entire hard drive. So if I wanted to go to my current PCs, my docs, I can drill into it. So you're going to use this to maybe bring files that you played around with on 808 and PC back out to 
a shared folder or a fold, common folder on your PC. And then I certainly have all of my vertical soft keys here. Cut, copy, paste, mark. Mark allows me to highlight multiples. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a new program by selecting new. And we're going to give it a name. And we support letters, numbers, and underscores. So if I wanted to call it, I'm going to call this, um, I don't know, OD. Uh, let's call it OD turn. Oops. OD underscore turn. One. Now, I do not need to give it the MPF. However, if I wanted to make this a subprogram file um, and I wanted to have an SPF extension, I can type in the .SPF and it will give me that function or that, that file type. But if I just type the standard and say, okay, it's automatically going to build a odturn1.mpf file and put me into the editor. So here I'm now starting to write programs. So at this point, this is kind of where that little reference chart comes in handy. You can start going through some of the basic functions or the safe start functions that you would normally put in writing a program. Um, I happen to be pretty familiar with a lot of them. So like for argument's sake, if I'm turning, the first thing I'm going to tell the system is I want to be in a G18. That is my orientation. Um, let's say for argument's sake, I want to always program in an absolute mode. I want to be in G90. Maybe I want to be in an inch mode, so I'm going to give the system a G700 for inch. And if I wanted to use a work coordinate, I could certainly type it. If I'm not using work coordinates, I don't have to give it to them. So I could start to type this command. I hit enter or input on my machine's keyboard. We'll move my highlight down to the next line, and we can continue from there. So let's say the next thing I want to do is load tool one. Type in T1. Now, if you start using multiple cutting edges or multiple offsets, quite handy when you have uh, like combination tools, um, then you're going to want to get used to using the D numbers. So it's not a bad idea to get in the habit of always giving it the D1, and then as you start to use different offsets, they're called cutting edges. You can build multiple offsets in the offset table. You can just toggle through them with a different D number. Um, you can certainly give yourself some notes. So it's an 80 degree turning tool, and then you can build it from there. So anything after the semicolon is a comment. So it's not going to read that as a given instruction. Now, one handy command to you get used to if you want to run straight RPM is G97. Um, this way, if the system already had a G96 constant surface speed issued, it would cancel that. Um, a lot of guys don't use G97 typically because normally the systems always start in straight RPM, but it's still a good habit to get into. And this way, when you start bouncing between CSS and non-CSS, that's how you do it. So I'm going to start up my spindle at 1,000 RPM and turn on my spindle clockwise direction. Maybe I want to turn my coolant on. I can give it an M8. I do not need the, the leading zero but I can put it. So M8, M08, both will work absolutely fine. Um, from there, uh, spindle's running, coolant's on. Maybe I want to give it a G95 to signify feed per rev and some feed rate that I'm going to potentially be running. And then this is straight G code. So literally, I could just tell the machine, hey, I want to wrap it to some position. So I'm going to wrap it to an X of 3.1. In this case, if I looked at my part, we'll say that the rough stock is 3 inch. And I'm going to wrap it to a Z0, so just off the part, right now aligned with the face. And let me say I'm going to do a simple facing cut. So I'm going to use a G1 for a feed move and tell the system to come to, I'm just going to go to like negative 30 thou, a little bit past. So I just fed down the face of my part. Maybe I'm going to pull back off the part and then wrap it. So we're going to go to a G0. And G1s, G0s, they're modal commands. So once you've turned it on, you don't have to keep repeating it. So that's why on the Z.1, I didn't need to give it the G1 again. So here I can tell it, now since I'm switching to a wrap because I want it to move fast, I can tell it to go to an X of 3 inch. Um, you don't need the decimal point. You don't need the trailing zero. I could just type three as well. Either one would be fine. So if that was the basic program, you could literally do your shutdown, give the system an M30, 
and continue uh, continue on. We could we could go. We could we could simulate it right now. So I could certainly hit the simulation button. Now she here says, please switch to automatic. So I need to hit automatic there. I'm just going to scoot this off the screen a little bit so I can get to my keys. My override is going to control the speed. Cycle starts is going to initiate the motion. We can zoom in. So here, and we run it again. I'll delete the window. Took so from wherever she was sitting, fed down, fed off, wrapped it back to a start point. So we can start to get some conceptual as to whether or not this is kind of doing what I thought it was going to do. So she positioned over, fed down, fed off, rapid back. And then we can kind of continue from there. So if you look at the part program, the next thing I would most likely want to do is turn this outside shape. So to do that, I'm going to go over back to edit by hitting the edit button. It gets me back to my editor. And now I'm going to continue moving on. So right now I'm just going to delete the M30 for, for this case. And what we're going to do is we're going to use our first turning cycle. So if you select the turning function, you have stock removal. That allows you to manage turning OD or ID and facing. I have grooving for putting grooves in, so we'll do that when we use the grooving. Uh, there's an undercut function if I wanted to put in a specific undercut profile behind the thread. I'll use thread for single point threading, so we're going to get a chance to use that in the job. And there is a cutoff cycle if I was going to use it to cut off the back of my part. So for handling a part like this, certainly there's a lot of passes and it's a regular shape. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to simply hit the stock removal function. Once I go into stock removal, now I'm going to fill out the page and we're going to create the routine. So the first thing I do is I'm going to name my contour. Um, so I'm going to give it um, a name. So I'm going to call it SHP for shape one. A um, couple rules here when you get to names. Uh, you don't want to use any machine-specific commands in the name. That'll goof it up. So, you know, I don't want to call it like um, Z1 because that would be a linear position or SP for spindle. You know, so, so you want to kind of make sure you pick a name that, that doesn't correlate to any type of commands in the system or that can goof you up a little bit. So I'm just going to use SHP1 for shape 1. This way I can build multiple shapes and I can call it shape 2, shape 3, shape 4. Now, once I've hit the input key, before I fill out the rest of the page, I want to hit the attach contour button. And what that, that's going to do is that's actually going to put me right over to this base editor. And now I get the contour button. And see what the system did? She just created a little label for me with SHP1 and SHP1 underscore E. So kind of beginning and end. So anything encapsulated between these two is going to be what's the shape that's associated with that cycle. So to drive, create the shape, I could try typing the shape right now if I wanted to, but I'm going to use the contour editor to draw the shape. So I go to contour editor, and now I start filling out the page. So it asks me, do I want diameter mode on or off? So here I could select between the two. All right, a couple different options. We want to use diameter mode on. That means all of my X values are going to be applied as diametric values. Give it some starting point. So I'm going to start at my two inch diameter, the OD of the thread. And I'm going to start at Z0. I want to approach in a rapid so I can come as fast as I, I want when I'm first getting in. That's fine. Now this transition to next element, this would be at the beginning of the function. So do I want to do a chamfer or a radius? What is the size of the chamfer or radius? And what is the angle it needs to exist at? So a lot of times, you know, I may not be 100% sure what, which angle I need. So I will fill out this first, and then I'll give it my next element. In this case, I'm doing a Z move back. To look at the print right here, you know, I'm starting at this position outside. I'm going to move back to the shoulder back here. So I'm going to move out to 1.150, uh, minus 1.150. So now, once I've accepted it, if you click your little arrows button, I can move my cursor around, and I can start to see more or less of the shape. So here, if I 
shut off the selection. I can arrow up. I can see my chamfer. So that was that lead-in chamfer that I gave it. So if I got the direction wrong, it might not have seen anything or coming down the wrong angle. So you can validate your input real quickly by putting the next element and then kind of zooming back. And you can then go back to an auto zoom and I can kind of build it from there. So a lot of times I leave it on auto zoom, I let the shape start building and then I can go back and look to see if I like it. Okay, so I moved back to this corner. The next move is gonna be a two axis move. So always keep track of this little orange indicator on your left side. That's where you are. So it's always gonna insert below that. So I just wanna be careful I didn't leave my indicator up top because it would now insert an event between these two functions which I certainly don't want. So I leave it sitting on the endpoint line. I hit the X for a two axis move and then I start to tell it where I'm going. So according to this print, I'm going to two and a quarter and I'm going all the way back to a Z of minus 1.75. So that gets me back to this position. Now this machine is commissioned as a rear turret. So you see um, I'm showing the, the, the top outside of that shape. Um, I don't have any end transitions, no radiuses or chamfers here. So I can simply hit the accept element. And now I get my taper. We can zoom in a little bit. You can start to see it. So there's my chamfer back and my taper. Now we continue moving. I'm going straight back to a Z of minus 2.5. Um, now when I get there, I do have a chamfer, or a radius, shall I say, of half inch. So I'm gonna let the system calculate it for me. Um, the free text input, that would be if I wanted to shove in an additional command, I could do that, like, uh, I don't know, turn cool on, turn cool off, something along those lines. I hit accept for the element. All right, now I've just positioned back to this corner. Now I'm going to do my final move in this case out to my rough stock and my Z all the way back to minus three. So that's positioning right back to this location. So Z of minus three and an X diameter of three. Type them in, hit accept. We can zoom in a little bit and now this should start to look like our shape. You can arrow up and down through each of the elements. At any point, if you needed to, you can arrow over with the blue arrow to the right key, come down, make some type of change. Remember to hit accept on the element, and I just made a change. And then you just kind of manage the shape from there. Once you get the shape that you're looking for, then you're gonna do the final accept button, and that's going to put in the instruction command. So here is the shape it calculated. So this would be describing, if you look at it, the final shape or what the final pass really would be if I was to cut that part. So once I've described the shape, I simply hit teach interface and now I've finished filling out the page. So you have cut for pass, how much material I want to leave for finish cut. I can have in different values for my finish, or if I want everything to have the same value, I can use the FAL function. Feed rate for roughing, maybe I'll run 20 thou. Feed rate for plunging, if I had a relief, which I don't, but I, can, I could have slowed down the feed. Feed rate for finishing. Operations, so now a lot of times when you get to these variable operations, sometimes it's not the clearest thing what it's asking for. So it's a great time or opportunity to leverage the onboard help on the system. So if you hit the help button, it's gonna load up the help screen specific to the event that we're in. So now I could scroll down and see where the value is, so lift off distance, so variable, up, right, this one's the one we want, machining type ranges. And then if you start to scroll down, you'll find even more information on those. So if you scroll down, here's all kinds of information, examples, and then it starts to show you the different numbers. It's coming up here somewhere. Uh, okay, so here are all of my different solutions. So a nine, I have selected because that's complete machining. So that means that I'm, I'm doing the roughing and the finishing all in the same op. And if I only wanted to rough because I wanted to go back and do a separate finishing cycle, 
I would then break them up to two cycle calls, and I would do a one, and I want to use an L for turning, and then I would go back and do a five as my second. So you can start to use the help to sort of figure out which number I want. Now, as you toggle them, it will change the graphics, so that can give you a little bit of an indication as well of what they're asking for here. But uh, normally I'll kind of look at the help and get my head around it that way. So in this case, I want to rough and finish. Um, I don't want to dwell for any chip breakers. Um, I don't want to do any interrupted feed path. That would be if I wanted to, like, almost like a peck drilling cycle with turning. It's kind of cool if you can't break the chip. And my retract amount, I usually use about the same as my cut amount. So you fill out the page, you hit accept. So that just went and inserted the cycle back up at the top. Now, the only thing you've got to make sure you do is these contours need to exist after your end of program. So I do need to have an M30 at some point after this. So now we can start to simulate the shape. So if I cycle start, there's my face, and now it's doing the turn. So I can crank up the speed, and now you see it come down, turns the shape. So that regular shape could have been ID, could have been OD, could have been any shape I want at that point. And you're just going to kind of repeat that process. If you had multiple shapes, you just build another one the same way. And it would just do it here below the below this one. So it can start keep building as many shapes as it needs to after your M30. Um, the shapes can be outside programs as well. I like to just give this demonstration because it's a pretty common method when I'm uh, starting to program. Okay, so here I'm at a point where I've um, you know, turned, I'm done with this tool, uh, maybe I want to get to some safe point. Um, a very common command for us is what's called the SUPA statement. So SUPA is a suppression of all of the active frames or offsets, um, specifically work offsets. This does not cancel tool offsets, so that's why I'm using a D0 to cancel my tool. And now I'm positioning based on the machine coordinate system. So it is important for me, um, I'll go a little smaller, to know where the machine zero is and where the travel is. So like if my machine zero is back at the tailstock, I probably don't have any plus travel relative to the machine coordinate system. So then certainly I couldn't go to five by five. Um, here, the machine simulator, I get travel wide open, so I'm just going to tell it to move to some location. Once I've retracted away or gone to the safe position with the super command, and it did it as a rapid because I told it a rapid, then I can change my tool to my next tool. So I'm going to use tool two. Tool two is my grooving tool. Um, maybe I don't want my D1, but I'm going to tell the system that this is a groove tool just for my notes. Um, I want to be, again, straight RPM, uh, 500, uh, some little speeds on. You know, maybe I, instead, let's do it a little differently. Maybe I want to use constant service speed. Um, so here, we could do a couple different things. So first, when I'm setting up my maximum RPM, it's an LIMS equals, and then whatever my max RPM is. So maybe I don't want to go above two grand. Then I can use a G96S and then define my surface footage. So I want to run 400 surface feet per minute. G95 is still active, and I can put it again if I wanted to and give it some feed. So I'm probably going to go at a little slower feed for grooving. And I could pre-position the tool if I want to. Certainly I could turn my coolant on in case somebody had shut it off in trim or between tool changes or whatnot, in case I'm doing a mid-program restart. And then we can build from there. So I need to go and I need to put a couple grooves on this part. So we go and select the turn button again, pick the groove function, and now we build a groove. So the groove cycle supports groove OD, ID, on tapers, on straight. And it's all a combination, comes into play with these variables down here. Um, and then it's really just kind of filling out the page. So in this case, my starting point along the facing axis is really my OD, right? So my starting point in this case for this groove is going to be two, right? My starting point in L, this would be my longitudinal axis, so this is my starting point in Z. Now, I can look at this, and I can start really on either side of the groove. 
And I'll find later what position I kind of started from. So maybe I'm working everything from the right side. So I'm going to tell it my starting point's a minus one. The width of the groove I have in this little notation of 150 thou. So we got 150 thou wide groove. And in the same detail, detail C, I have a depth of 0.1. It's an unsigned value. The system knows your OD or ID a little later. Um, do I need any angle or not? You can even see right here, it gives you some little notes. So zero straight or 180, 90 would be face. So certainly I don't have any angle, so I can give it a zero. Do I have any angle on my walls? We can leave them blank. We could tell it I don't have any angle, so I'll give it zero, zero. I can control whether I do a radius or a chamfer, and the way I denote these is with a plus or a minus. So if I give it a minus sign, it will automatically build a chamfer. And if you go into help, it'll explain that to you. So I'm going to do a chamfer, and let's say I'm going to do a chamfer of 50 thou. This is the back relief of that thread. And then the rest of them, I don't want anything. So I'm just going to zero them out for the other four. Finish allowance, so I'm going to leave 2 thou and 2 thou. My IDEP is my PEC amount, so I'll use 50 thou for a PEC. Dwell at the bottom of the groove. And now I can control and see where the little black dot is. It's very important. So by using my select key, I can control the orientation of the groove and where my position data comes from. So that's where the little black dot is. So I want to make sure I'm using a 5, because remember, I programmed it from the right side of the groove. So it's then going to take the width and make sure it goes to the left for the width. Variable retract path for backing up. We'll do 50 thou. So I fill it out. I hit accept. I just saved the groove. Now, I have two grooves that are almost identical. So instead of having to build the cycle all over again, I can go to edit. I can turn my mark function on. I can highlight the cycle, copy, paste. And now, any of these cycles, if I simply hit the recompile button, allows me to re-edit them. So I know the next groove is at a diameter of two and a quarter, and at a Z position back of minus two. I know based on the print here, that it's a 300 thou wide by 150 deep. So we can update that. And really, everything else should stay the same except maybe these chamfers I don't want anywhere near as big. Maybe I want a nice little chamfer break on those two, but the internals, I'm gonna leave square. Okay, so fill out the page, hit accept. We can now go to simulate it and see if I had any typos. And I personally always like to simulate in stages like this. So this way, if I do have an issue, I'm not trying to debug the whole program. I'm just working on one simple area. And there's my two grooves. If we are to zoom in, and I'll zoom relative to my little cursor here. So wherever I stage my cursor, I'm using my keyboard, but I could also use the blue arrows. I can zoom in. So here, that's that back chamfer. Remember, I was just putting one chamfer on the back side of the part. That's where that would be. And then the other one, if we zoom back over, put it right on top. There's my two little corner breaks, my two little chamfers. So the system's compensating for the entire tool geometry because when I build the grooving tool, right, right up here, Additionally, I tell it the width of the grooving tool. So it knows there's a 1 8 wide tool in here because that's how I built the tool. Okay, let's go back to auto zoom. Our shape is starting to kind of take shape, no pun intended. And we'll keep moving in here. All right. So the only thing we got to really do now is we got to put the thread on and we got to drill a hole. So we're going to keep on editing. Now, earlier, I went to my retraction plane by using this super command, right? Super D0, G0, and that's a simple, easy way to retract. Um, but maybe I don't want to have to type it out every time. Maybe it's a common point, and I don't want to make the mistake of maybe entering something wrong. Well, you can create little routines, and I created one earlier 
called home. And I had to be to create it as an SPF. It could be an MPF file. It really makes no difference. MP, SPF stands for sub-program file. But within it, it has a couple of simple instructions. There's my super line. I'm reloading the tool offset in case I'm going to need it again when I'm done, and giving it an end of sub with an M17. So I fill out this little cycle, and since the cycle is sitting in the base folder that my part program is, which is uh, OD turn one right here, all I have to do is type the word home now, whatever the name of that program was, don't need the extension, and it will do that instruction. So now it just sent it home, so I don't have to keep doing that all the time. T3, uh, D1, this will be thread. Maybe I'm going to go back to straight RPM, some spindle RPM, turn on my spindle. Maybe I want to have, um, you can do uh, multiple encodes on the same line if you wanted to. Um, turn on my coolant. Once my coolant's running, um, probably ready to get to my thread. So we can jump over to turn, jump over to thread. Now there are four threading cycles. So you have what's called chain threading, which is a variable pitch and a variable shape thread. You have tapered threading, and this will support OD or ID, but any of your standard tapered threads. You have face threading, the threading in the x-axis, or you have the standard long threading, which is what we're going to use. So from here, really just fill out the cycle. So the starting point, all right, so the thread starting point along the longitudinal axis, so obviously longitude they're referring to is Z, the long axis. So it's starting at zero. The major diameter of my thread, the thread point, the thread end point on the longitudinal axis. So on my little part here, we'll bring over this, the drawing for you. Um, the back shoulder is 150. I don't want to quite go right to that with the threading tool, give myself a little clearance. Point, so 125, let's say. Um, I don't have a different diameter at the end. If you had a little taper you had to compensate for, you could. Uh, thread run out path in the beginning. I like to give it about one lead of the thread, if I can. Run out path without sign on the end, if I set it to zero. She's going to hold the minor diameter right into that relief, which is what I would want. The thread depth, so let's say for argument's sake, I'd already looked this thread up and I knew it was an 80 thou thread depth. Put it here. Finish allowance, maybe I'll take 2 thou for a finishing cut. I have an in-feed angle. It's like that compound angle. So, you know, any of us are old school guys that ever threaded on a manual lathe and you had your compound at 29 and a half degrees, that's what this is. So normally you use half of the insert profile. So in this case, I got a 60 degree threading insert, so I'm going to use an in-feed angle of 30 degrees. This way it'll ensure that it's working on the front of that edge. Um, NSP, starting point and orientation. I don't need to clock the thread, so I'm good. Number of cuts, so maybe I know that I want to take six cuts to rough it out, and then I'm going to take one spring pass, that's my NID, number of non-cuts or spring passes. Uh, thread pitch, okay, so this value here will be controlled by a parameter a little later, you'll see. So we're using 12 threads per inch, and do I want to do constant depth or constant volume? So I can change the OD, ID, and then constant depth. See how the lines are the exact same? Constant volume means it's going to keep reducing its depth to maintain its chip load based on my six position. So you kind of got to, you know, kind of play around with that factor a little bit. All right. Number of threads. If I had a multi-lead, I can handle it here. My retract, about 100,000 should be good. And down here... That's final. You see how it says one is for millimeters, two is for threads per inch? I need to make sure I put this at a value of two. And that is what told this PIT field to support threads per inch. So you fill out the page, you hit accept, threading cycles in there. From here, we're going to reference the machine or reference the carriage out of the way. We'll put our final drilled hole in. So we type in that, we type in our T4, D1, make sure we're running at some RPM. Maybe I want my coolant there. 
G95 feed per rev, and maybe I'm going to be running at a feed of 4 tap per rev on this drill, and I'm going to roughly pre-position my drill. We can use drilling cycles, so there's just basic centering, there's deep hole drilling, boring, so a whole bunch of different cycles here. So I'm going to do a simple drill centering, retract point, go to 100,000, I'm done. Reference is where I'm drilling from, my plane. Safety distance, how close I want to get to it before I start feeding. My drill depth, I don't know, maybe it's minus 3.5, so I'm going through the hole and I don't want to dwell. So we fill that out. Now one thing I neglected to do, because I'm moving kind of fast, one thing you do have to do when you go to drilling, it's a little unique, is you're no longer in a G18 plane in drilling. You're actually going to switch the machine to a G17 to support the drilling cycle, or it would give us an alarm. Once we're done drilling, we're doing a single hole, certainly just the center of the part. Um, if I want to, I can switch the system back to G18. Um, I could shut my spindle off, shut my coolant off, maybe send the machine to that home position, and away I go and end my program. So if we do a final simulation, and we run this one last time, we're going to see the rest of the contour, our grooves, our thread, and the drill doesn't show a whole lot because it's just drilling at the center. But just so you can kind of see, so there's our groove. Threads it, and then runs the drilling cycle. Once it's done drilling, she'll move on to the next operation. Like I said, kind of drilling is a little uneventful. Okay, so, so that's the basic mechanism I would go through, so there's the retract to start to step in or, or create a part program. Now, the next step here is certainly start to handle our automatic mode. You know, we, we, we set it up, we programmed it, but what can we do as far as running the job? So we're going to go through just a few, couple features here, and then we'll certainly open up to some questions. So automatic mode. Um, so in automatic, I'm going to transition over to the automatic screen by selecting the execute button. And you'll see that in the upper right hand corner of the editor. So when we go back to the editor, we're going to hit the execute, and that's going to switch us over to auto mode. It's also going to pre-select that program. From there, we can do real-time simulation if we like, and then this is the same base graphics that you've been using, but now it's matched to the machine. So as I stop the machine, the graphics will start. As I crank it up, the graphics will start to move. So I'm going to use real-time simulation to handle that. From there, what, do I, what happens if I want to start in the middle of a program? Very common scenario. So the mechanism, just like we support in other controls, is going to be triggered through block search, but the function is going to be slightly different. So when you hit block search, we're going to jump you back to our standard editor. You're going to scroll down to the line at which you want to start from, and then you're going to use one of the vertical soft keys. So you're going to pick either to contour, to endpoint, without calc. And that tells us how we want to handle where the start is. So really the big ones you're going to use is either um, to contour or to endpoint. That's with calculation. So that means the system's going to scan to that point and set up any modal commands that would have occurred prior to the starting point and make sure they're on. Or if you're starting from a safe start point because you already built the program with that in mind, you can do without calculation, and then it'll just start from that point. The other thing we want to look at is um, the secondary search me mechanism. So here, you know, kind of what it looks like once I go to start. Um, once I've started it, you're going to see there's going to be a two-cycle start, cycle start hit. So we're next going to see the continue program with an NC start. Once you do the final cycle start, she's going to continue cutting or continue to cut. Um, another really handy feature is what we call return from jog or our repause mode. So what that lets us do is in the middle of a part program, I can initiate a cycle stop like you see here on the top of the screen. I can hit the jog button. I can move the machine to some staged area. Once I'm ready to start again, I can select auto again and hit cycle start. That will automatically, as long as I haven't hit reset, 
will automatically position me back to the point which I stopped at. It's going to vector there, so it's going to go shortest path, and then continue cutting. So we'll get a chance to do that real quick. And let's transition over to auto mode. So as I mentioned, I'm here in the editor. It's time to run. All I have to do is hit execute. Execute's going to automatically put me right over to auto mode. It automatically puts the highlight right at the beginning of the part program. She is ready to run. So if I was good, I could cycle start. Machine's going to start going. So it's got tool one in there now. Crank up the feed rate a little bit. It's doing its turning. It loaded tool two, tool three, tool four. Drills our hole. Done. So it just ran through the program, and that's the basic mechanism of how it would work. But if you wanted to have the real-time sim on, I could come in, and it's going to look just like the graph has looked earlier, but this is really running the program. So as I crank it up or down, the physical axes would stop as I go. So this is pretty handy, um, just if I want to get a little better visual of maybe where I am within the part program. So here I can see I'm grooving, turning, and now she's going to go into the drilling cycle. She's, she's drilling, so if I back up, you see it's drilling that hole, pulls out, away it goes. So just really simply while it's running, just sort of prior to even initiating, just hit real-time sim, and it'll launch up. Now, if she's running, I can come into it, and she's going to pick up wherever she's sitting. So if I have the window deleted, it would just start physically simulating right from there. So it kind of retains the data and just kind of picks up from there. So you can go in and out of it if you, if you need to. Okay, now let's say we're in the midst of doing something and I want to jog the machine away. I want to get in, check a dimension, something. So I hit cycle start, but you notice I haven't hit reset. So at this point, you know, I'm at a two inch diameter roughly, I'm about a you know, one inch back on the part, so if I go out to jog, we'll back out of our set function, I can now start to move the machine to some new location. Open my doors, check a dimension. Now when I'm ready to start running again, simply hit my auto function, hitting the auto button, cycle start, machine's going to reposition back to that point and then continue cutting. And you can do that off and on as much as you want. Now, the same scenario, right? We're in the middle, we reset, we want to start midstream. Well, if I want to start midstream and she hasn't already been running, um, now I use the block search function. So I go into block search, it puts me in the editor, I can pick an interruption point, and this would be where it would figure out the point at which I paused it and start from there, or I can scroll to some new location, right? So maybe I know I want to start over here, tool two. And then I select either two contour, two endpoint. Um, if I'm starting at say point, I can use two endpoint. If I want the machine to kind of anticipate its lead in, then I use two contour. Cycle start. Now the machine's going to, does always the double cycle start, like I showed you earlier. And then picks up and starts running at that point. So whether I'm pausing midstream or starting in the middle with the block search, I'm going to use a combination of either function to kind of handle um, what do I want to do when I'm in the, in the middle of a program. Now another function that's a little different in this control is how do I edit the part program. So that we give you kind of two ways to do it. If I use the program correct program button in the lower right-hand corner, it actually, on the other controls, it'll launch you to the full editor. But here, we actually give you a little hybrid editor. So if I wanted to just quickly say, you know what, I wanted my spindle speed to be 1,200, I can do that, make a quick update, without having to go fully into the program editor, find the line I wanted to edit. So here, you see the, the edit took, but I didn't actually leave auto. I just hit my correct program and gave me a quick little reference. The limitation, however, is I don't have the ability of correcting the can cycles per se. I would have to know the variable that I wanted to make the change to. Um, if I want to get to the full editor, really just hit the program button. Program's a shortcut key, back to the part program. Come on down, make your change. Okay. 
let's go back here. We don't need to print up. So what we're going to do now, now that we've kind of gone through the overall basics of the 808, we're going to open up the floor to any questions. So what you guys have in front of you, there's that Q&A panel. So by all means, um, if there's any questions on this content or any content or any topics you'd like to discuss here, as we have a little bit of time left in the hour and a half we blocked out, I am open to your questions. So fire away. It looks like there was a couple questions that came in while I was typing. Okay, um, this is coming from somebody. They're asking about our Thanet compatible mode, um, and I didn't mention that in the in the webinar here. But there is a way to run Thanet programs by switching into what's called an ISO mode on this control. And what they were wondering is. Um, is there any way to select what type of codes the system is reading? So I think what they're referring to is in FANUC, specifically in turning, there are three different formats or protocols of G-code. Um, and with that being said, you have to kind of know, like if you're dealing with a post-processor or you've been written writing, you know, what, what form you've been using, but there's A, B, and C. So with A, B, and C, we can support all three. There's a parameter in the system that would have to be changed to do that. Uh, but yes, we can support all three protocols. I think that's what you were talking to. Um, is there a counter for cycle time and parts in the 808 control? This came in from Steve. Yes, there is. So if we go back and we see on the vertical soft key, there's a time counter button. So this gives you your cycle time. So as I'm running, this would run. So that, that cycle time before was 15 minutes. And if I hit the select key, I can turn, in my part, turn on my parts counter. So here I can toggle through that counter. OK, well, this is an interesting question. Will my 808 program run in an 828 or an 840? So those of us that are probably used to um, the higher controls notice that the G-code even looks a little different. Um, this is using some historically older cycles in this version of the control than we do leverage in our advanced controls. Um, however, they are fully compatible. Um, now, it's compatible, meaning I can take a program from the 808 and run it in the 828 or 840, and I've done it myself. So it actually works very clean. You don't have to really do any editing. You just bring it in and run. Uh, the limitation, however, because the 828 and the 840 are advanced controls, is they have a lot more cycle functionality. So if I'm using cycles programming in, in the 828 or 840, I'm not going to be able to bring the programs back into the 808. Um, if it's just standard, you know, standard G code, rapid speeds, um, constant service speed, that kind of stuff, all will work fine. That's really when they get to the can cycles, so like the contour turning, the drilling cycles. Because if you're familiar with those controls, there's a lot more in them. Um, so, but there is there is definitely compatibility there. Um, here's another question: Can the 808 support live tools? Um, it can actually. Um, there's certainly some limitations, um, and you do need to be, I believe, in the advanced configuration to use live tooling, um, but the control <coughs> itself absolutely can support um, live tools in the advanced variant. Um, you'll find that uh, the advanced allows um, a bunch of more um, higher-end functionality. Uh, the mills, like I said earlier, you can do fourth axis. You can do um, um, what we call... Uh, um, uh, like peripheral turning, so I can wrap shapes around bars. Um, it's called a trace cell function, transformation cylinder functionality. There's a bunch of added advanced features you can get to um, on the um, in the advanced the Edward advanced function. Uh, so yes, all right. Any other questions for the group? Great. Well, I'm going to stop the recording here, and then I want to hand out. The, uh, the handout I was giving everybody. So let's 